I can't grow mm. a plant. Why would I spend my money on growing? And I started Sourface with only $30,000. I cashed out most of my Roth IRA to start Sourface. Mm -hmm. Right. Oof. Like, you got to do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? That sucks. I was just starting that Roth IRA a couple of years back. <laughs> so, but you know what? The, the dividends off th that, doing that is far greater than that Roth IRA could ever give me. Welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top dispensary owners and experts in this space so that you can stay up to date with the latest trends and strategies that you'd otherwise miss out on. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, Matt, welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Thanks for hopping on the show. My pleasure. Awesome. Awesome. So for the audience, can you please tell us who you are, the name of your store or stores, and where you're located and locations? <laughs> My name is uh, Matt Koppelman. Um, I am a managing member and founder of Score420. Um, right now we have six live dispensaries in New Mexico, two more opening up and probably in about, say, within th three months. I'm out here in Jersey starting our Atlantic City operations, Massachusetts operations, and Maryland operations. Um, we're going to be doing dispensary and uh, manufacturing here in New Jersey, um, probably just retail and for right now in Massachusetts. And in Maryland, uh, we will be doing manufacturing. Wow, that's uh, that's super impressive. We'll uh, we'll get into uh, all of that in a little bit. But before you got into the cannabis space as a whole, uh, can you give us a little bit of insight into that? After college, I you know was a corporate jerk for a while. Um, then I went to my father's restaurants. Uh, one of the locations was in distress, so you know I went in there, cleaned it up, got a profitable. Uh, it really expand the alcohol, all that type of thing, and you know. Like in most families, sometimes you don't see eye to eye with other with your you know parents and how things are done. Or you have to do your own thing. So that's what I did, and I founded Sour Face in 2014 in Washington State as a uh, marijuana processor. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing that. Basically, we were a, a value uh, a value product company, meaning you know. I would sell, you know, I sell to the stores that they would sell the fifteen dollar eights or the ten dollar eights, um, the two dollar joints. You know, um, I've sold, you know, hundreds of thousands of joints, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. probably close to a million, or a little <laughs> bit over. It's sour face. At score four twenty, we're beyond that already. Well, we're not beyond right. that. I think we're probably close to probably about eight hundred thousand so far since we opened in twenty twenty two. So I mean. Give incredible take. incredible yeah. <laughs> now very quickly because you skimmed over something that was pretty awesome that i thought is that you know you said that you came out of college and essentially did restaurant rescue uh for your family's restaurant well, no 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 before that i was in the corporate world i worked for a company uh, called ingram micro okay um in santa Ana, california for a couple years and before that, I worked for a company called Aqueduct. I was in the operations department. Right. This is all online stores, online fulfillment. It was pretty hot in, you know, 2002, 2003. You know what I mean? Right. It's a different time then. Um, you know, I was just like most other kids, you know, college kids graduate. Probably to this day, all starry. -eyed. I'm going to, you know, climb the corporate ladder, you know, and this and that. You know, and after a while, I just felt like it just wasn't for me. And then plus I got laid off. So I just kind of sealed the deal. <laughs> right. Um, and then I kind of went a blue collar route for a while. I was an independent contractor of company called Knockout Lockouts. So basically they had contracts with uh, roadside assistant companies and insurance companies. So I would do everything in my little Hyundai accent mm -hmm. um, besides a toe. I could go, I go change your tire on the five. I could, you know, um, change the tire like i said um, and, and actually we could actually break into the car unlock the car with you know with the bladder and the and all that stuff you know it was just something for me to you know just kind of do for a while because i've just kind of jaded by the white collared you know corporate stuff and it's just like you know, i need a little break i still need to make money i don't want to lose money right. you know what i mean so that was the best way for at that moment and then you know i went to i was taking a six sigma course and try i was going to go for my green belt I don't know if familiar with Six Sigma. Or... It's like uh, like the lean. Um, yeah, lean manufacturing. Yeah, lean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was doing that, and I used my father's restaurants as a 
project. So I flew okay. out there and started mm-hmm. looking at things, and I was like, nah, this this ain't good. And my father's been doing this stuff for um, almost 50 years coming on here. You know what I mean? He's kind of, yeah, you know, he doesn't want to be in there, and you know. Right. And when you're in, when you're not watching your employees, <clears throat> they take, you know, some people take advantage of you. Mm. So you always got to keep your eye on the ball, especially in the restaurant industry and the right. cannabis industry too. Uh, um, they're very similar. People like it, they're kind of different, but they're very similar in how they're, they're functioned. You know, you need a lot of labor. You know what I mean? Um, you need, you know, you really don't need high skill labor. I mean, besides, you know, if, except for like growers and that type of thing, that's a whole, I'm not talking, I'm just talking about in, in our company, people who trim flour or, or pack pre-rolls or two pre-rolls or uh, label pre-rolls, you know what I mean? You, you don't need a college degree for that. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? So, um, and, uh, you know, I was in there, I was looking at it, and I just saw, I didn't like what I was doing, so I just stayed there. I didn't even finish my green belt. I just went right to work and just started making changes, and, you know, and, and everything's a challenge because the community's got to accept you. Like, who's this guy coming and doing all this shit, you know, um, changing everything, and, you know, you get challenged a lot. It's just people don't even realize that, like, in business, you know, and especially when you're dealing with the, the service industry or anything with service, like... The, the community, like if they don't know you, you know, right away, you know, I, it took me about a year to earn people's respect in the community. Mm-hmm. But after that, you know, it was all gravy, but it, it was just in that moment, you know, and we were in an urban area too. So, you know, we had a lot of foot traffic. It, it was kind of a, a weird mix because we had the state capitol right up the street. So we would get politicians that would come in. We had Governor Rendell would come in to eat in our frequent in our restaurant, you know, one, you know, one table, you have lawyers, another table, you have pagans, the motorcycle gang, another table, you know, it's just all different mix. It, it was kind of cool. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I just really, we had a liquor license that we weren't even utilizing. We we're just selling beer. So I start, I got a Jaeger machine, start charging $3 Jaeger shots, start bring, building in a clientele and just build it off that. I had put in drafts, you know, $5 Hennessy shots, you know, just something i'd make a good profit margin and we were a sub shop so they're not going to stay in there all night they just want to get their cheap shots and go over to the bar next door and yeah. you know go do their business you know what i'm saying so that's what i utilized and we made a lot of money off the alcohol um it's insane <laughs> but like i said in in the in the in the prelude like my father and i didn't see eye to eye on things you know god bless him i just had to do my own thing mm-hmm. um actually he fired me so, oh gosh, okay, but <laughs> but I was going for my marijuana license before that, and mm. right when he did that, I don't know if it was God or what, I got the call from the license. They call him like you know, the investigator who you know, they they go through you know, all your finances, where it's coming from, and they vet you. But the, the licensing, you know, investigator called me, left the vest, left the message on myself, and said, uh. We, you, you know, we're ready, you know, when you're ready for inspection, let us know. So that means I'm ready to go. So right. it was kind of like a blessing in disguise. And, you know, my dad and I worked out a little deal or whatever. I took care of business when he would take care of with him. I packed my shit, went right to Washington State and just started. Never just, looked back. Never looked back. Exactly. And Washington State was very interesting, too. Hmm. Um when I got there, I, I started utilizing this comp. Well, okay. The first product I sold was pressed hash. So okay. I got like a tumbler. I bought and why some- pressed hash? Why, why was that your first product? It was the easiest. Okay. I'm, I'm not the, you know, I'm not a grower. I can't grow mm-hmm. a plant. Why would I spend my money on growing? And I started sour face with only $30,000. I cashed out my, most of my Roth IRA to start sour mm-hmm. face. Right. Oof. Like, you got to do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? That sucks. I was just starting that Roth IRA a couple of years back. <laughs> so, but you know what? The, the dividends off the, that, doing that is far greater than that Roth IRA could ever give me. 100%. So what at that stage. Made, what made you have the belief in yourself to do that? It's, it's just in me, dude. Like, <laughs> take or swim, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I mean, my parents weren't taking care of me. I was right. working for you know, working f- with my dad or for him. Is you know, you could say it because I never 
you know, never got the ball to place. So, you know, it's still open today. There's one location still available and it's really good. It's, you know, it's called the sandwich man in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's a great, I, I go, I go there still, you know, even though my father and I, you know, don't talk or whatever, mm-hmm. but I love that sandwich. So <laughs> it's worth it. So what was that first year? Like, you know, you cashed out all the money, you went all in on this business, you're selling suppressed hash. What was that year like for you? Well, I mean, I, I, if people, people don't remember, but us old school guys did do, Mm -hmm. they called it the 25%, 25, 25 tax, right? I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Washington state had this tax rate. So if I bought from a producer, it would be 25%. I would have to pay tax on that. And then when I sell it, or the producer would have to pay that tax, and I would have to pay the processing tax that I sold to the retailer at on 25%. Okay. And what was going, and then the retailer would sell it to the customer at 25% excise tax plus the sales rate, sales tax or whatever it is in the municipality, right? Yeah, right. So... <laughs> That that started to ruin a lot of us. Like we were in arrears in taxes, right. you know, and the state, thank God, rescinded that pretty quickly. They made the end user pay it, me the customer. So mm-hmm. they started out at uh, it was like I said, it was twenty five for the excise, and they raised it for the end u- for the customer end user to thirty seven percent. That's a lot. And then plus you got the sales tax. I don't know, Washington's like average eight to nine percent, depends where sure. you're at. So it was just eight percent. So you know that's forty five percent, right? Thirty seven plus eight is forty five percent tax, just in that price. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, for taxes. Yeah. That's, I mean, what that does is that drives guys like me and drives my prices down because the customer only want to pay so much, the retailers only want to pay so much, right? So everybody and there's way more processors ratio. Than there were retail stores. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, but I've luckily found a, a niche. So I started selling cheaper items. And then I hire these third party salesmen to go around and I give them a, a percent of what they would bring in. So I got, I got, I got set, I got uh, the LCB in 2015. This is like the by its second year, about a year before, yeah, about a year. I was, I actually had my first administrative, um, uh, what was the word I'm going, not, it's a fine, but, um, violation there, there it is Mm. violation called true party of interest violation. And they were saying that these guys, these salesmen that, that were working for me off commission were actually owners. That's what they were. That's what the, okay. Yeah. I'll get, I'll get to it. It, Yeah. Yeah. Trust me at the end of the day, it, it, it changed. But, and yeah, and this, these are the AGs, like the attorney general Mm -hmm. and their assistants fighting me in administrative law court. So I had to scrap together $12,000 to represent myself back in the, and that's cheap compared to what we pay today in lawyer fees. (laughs) But Right, right. And this is after you took out the $30,000 out of your Roth uh, IRA. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, a few things happened. Um, I had some good sales. and nice. uh, okay. Yeah, whatever. I made it happen. However it happened, I made it happen. That's that's <laughs> the bottom line. I, right. gave, I gave that lawyer in Spokane at the Spokane Club, I gave him, like, fucking, because I already paid him something, but I gave him, like, 10, no, was it 10? It was, like, five grand in cash, something like mm-hmm. that, to pay it off. And then we walked over to the, to the ALJ, you know, courtroom, and... And the and, and the funny story is the lady who was the judge, she was an assistant AG of Idaho okay. before she was, you know, you know, administrative judges, they're just paid, you know, right, ALJ right. judges, whatever. I mean, they really, it's nothing, it's only like, uh, like I said, law, it's nothing to do with civil or, or criminal, but it's a pretty cushy job, you know, you settle child support disputes and, you know what I mean, and unemployment disputes, you know, and right. LCB and whatever disputes with a government agency, I guess that's basically, but I, you know, she was, she was really cool. And I got a good vibe from her. Um, she was wearing leopard skid pants under her robe. So 
it's wild. But yeah, but you know what? I I, I felt good. I didn't think I was going to get screwed because she's not she she's not a criminal. She's not she's not going to put me in jail for having some weed on me. She's just going <laughs> by the book. What they what their code is to what they're saying I did against that code. You get what I mean? Yeah. So I was pretty confident I had a fair trial with her. So, and you know, I'm glad I did because the, the, um, the enforcement officer who was representing, you know, he was lying and my uh. lawyer didn't even know what was going, you know, this guy was talking. So I had to take the piece of paper and, and tell him what was going on. So basically what was going on was in, in July, July 2014, um, no, no, July 2015, excuse me, they said you have to manifest your samples. So when we first started, you could just give samples, like you, you just allocate it out. You didn't okay. even need a manifest. Okay. Right. Whatever. So they didn't implement that until months later. But this guy was saying this, this was implemented in June. But my offense was in May. You get what I'm saying? Okay. So the law was even implemented then. Right. And this guy said, well, I broke that. I broke that statute, you know, that was enacted in July. Right. He's trying to he was trying to F me on that. And this lawyer, he's taking a nap. You know what I mean? I'm 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 listening to this shit. I'm like, no, no, no. And I had to write it down and like give him an elbow, say, hey, tell him this. This is not right. And they, oh, isn't it true? Then you know, was actually enacted in July. He'd be like, "Yeah, he fucking he lied." Yeah. And I swear that ALJ just looked at him like he was an asshole. Hmm. I, am I allowed to swear? I apologize. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fine. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> this guy, this guy was a dirtbag, dude. He he, right. he dressed in a cheap suit, and I, I I'm not gonna name his name, but I had issues with him before. It, it enforced, mm -hmm. and that's the. And that's I'm gonna go into tangent about enforcement officers. And this this is for any marijuana, any marijuana businessman who has a license and has to deal with the deal with enforcement. Okay. Each individual mo that I've noticed so far, okay. I mean, it might be different for other people. This is what I've experienced in my 10 years in the legal industry. Is that is that each enforcement officer has a different interpretation of the law. Hmm. So one guy will tell you to do this shit, and then six months later, because and, and another thing they don't tell you, they have high turnover. At least in Washington State, they were turning them over. They, they, they just didn't want to do it. They went to DEA. They did so something else. no consistency. Else. Yeah. They just – no, no consistency. Exactly. So whatever. So the court, the court ends, and we get the, the order right. So the one – you know um, – it was two charges. One was a, a biotrack transportation charge. I pled guilty to that because, it, you know, that did happen. So that's a $500 fine, whatever. That's just like a small infraction. The true party of interest, what they were trying to get me on, was, was revocation of license. They would have took my license away. Okay. I was ruled in favor of me, obviously, oh, or yes. wouldn't be here, right? So, but. She wrote, she sizzled them in that order. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. sizzled the LCB. They're like, you don't even follow your own rules and blah, blah. It's just, you know, just basically saying, like, you need to take a better look at what you're doing. Because, right. you know, after that, the true party of interest, that opened up, like, this, that opened up the, the commission on, on, on percentages. Right, right, right. So, that so that opened, first year was just filled with a lot of, regulatory issues and tax issues for the most part. Yeah. And, and I'm glad at that juncture in my life, I, I was single, you know, I could live real lean, mm. you know what I mean? Like I didn't have, you know, for the first two years I was sleeping in my car when I was making deliveries from East Washington to Western Washington. I right. had a Chevy Sonic. I used to pull up to a park or something and, you know, I don't care now. Statue. I used to take, take the <laughs> container out. Right. You know, and I put my feet up and, and just, you know, and just camp sit. out. It, yeah. You had to do what you had to do. And then, you know, and I'm starting to like make, you know, getting more revenue in, getting more sales, getting bigger a little bit. And I'm starting to say to myself, well, why the hell am I sleeping in my car still? I can afford a hotel. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I start going to hotels, you know. Right. Between, and then hotels and then rent and then a house. 
And look, now you're moving into a, a nice new place right now. Oh no, we're running this place. Uh, ah, okay, I'm, nice. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm here. I'm here to open up the East Coast operations. I'm not going right. to be here in the long, long term. You know. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. Um, I have an 18th month old kid, and mm-hmm. he, you know, he. You know, I'm old. I'm 45 now. I won't be 46 coming up, and and it's just kind of like you know, it, it's getting to the point. It's time to spend more time with family, and then. You know, it's just one thing I will say about this industry, if 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 any part, any anybody can understand, you know, who has a license or, you know, who's been in the cannabis industry, it it, fuck, it sucks sometimes. It's bad. <laughs> it is. It is difficult. It is you very, know? very difficult. But if you get experience, like people don't understand, like before we did score 420, you know, we built that up. We had, you know, six years of experience. Plus my partners that who I brought in, you know, they had experience too. Mm-hmm. And because mm-hmm. I used to do business with them in Washington right. State. So we built a trust. So yeah, that, that kind of takes me to my next question um about kind of the journey of where um literally in the last sentence you're talking about sleeping in your car and now you're talking about opening up a East Coast operation. So um what was in between that? How did you go from in the car to, you know, uh, young, uh, grinding it out, trying to make it work to kind of where you are right now. So in between that, that time, you know, sales were, I, I had some changes going on. I, I, sure. I took a summer in California. I lived in Seal Beach for a summer. <clears throat> and uh, that was like, in, that was in 2017. And uh, summer 2017, I, I've been busting my hump, you know, and it's just kind of like, I want to, you know, I kind of want to, you know, you know, find a lady, you know, start progressing as a man. I'm like 38, 30, I'm, I'm like 37, 38. I'm just, mm-hmm. you know, it's time to find a, a woman I want to marry. So went to California and just started doing things, you know, and, you know, meeting people. And, you know, eventually I did find my, my wife is today, you know, I did find her, nice. you know, and, and, you know, she followed me right back to Washington. <laughs> so... <laughs> But you know she's been a big help. She she was in, integral with Sourface because you know Sourface had its ups and downs as the time went on, like more competition, prices are going down, you know. And then in 2020, I was in Mexico and um, I had a dirt biking accident. I snapped my leg, so I was in Mexico for about three months. And uh, I was lucky. My wife's Mexican, so I was staying with her family, and and I had Mexican insurance. So nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole operation, believe it or not, was like twelve grand. It, it oh. cost a hundred grand here in the states. Like, um, it did top notch work. Yeah, you know. No, note to listeners: don't break your legs. But if you were to, you can go to Mexico <laughs> to do so. That's well, the message you're trying to get across, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, yeah, I got. I, well, it's just where I was at. I mean, if I sat my leg in the States, I wouldn't want to in the States, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't handle everything in Mexican hospitals, but mm-hmm. they can handle what they were doing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but, but the bottom line is it tied me up. So, <laughs> and, you know, sales, I just got my eye off the prize a little bit, you know, and I was a little jaded, and plus the med- pain medicine and, every, you know, everything was just, you know, yeah, mm-hmm. whatever. So, I, I made lemons to lemonade, so... Um, I like I said, the writing was on the wall. Washington State, like the, it's just too saturated, and I'm not just I, I can't be running to stores every day for the rest of my life just to make a decent living. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It just mm-hmm. trained the hell out of me. You can't see your wife and kid. You know, it's just it's hard. You know, talk to those fat panda reps who go around hustling. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's yeah. just it's 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 insane. So, but I, I noticed at that moment around that time that wa- that New Mexico had their licensing ca- rec open, applications okay. open. Yeah. I said, look at this. I said, this is this is where it's at. You know, I'll just I'll just give you I'll just give you the the quick cheat sheet. Like the only mm-hmm. way you can make serious money in this industry. I mean, on average, I'm not saying there's there's you know. Not successful, I mean, ultra successful manufacturers, but retailers have a better opportunity to make more money quicker and keep more of the profits. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, well, somewhat, but there's a lot more people coming in. When you got 350 people coming in a day, 
you know, those little margins become, you know, they stack. That's how we use that money to, you know, open up other stores. You know what I'm saying? We don't pocket the money, so to speak. You know what I mean? Right. Right. But, but if you had like a successful one or two stores and you're just a thing, you know, you're just, you know, you don't want to expand. You can, I mean, you can make 30, 40 grand a month and draw if you wanted to and still be kicking it, you know? They're saying net of operation for real healthy dispatchery is about 10% overall. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah. Especially when you bring in seven, you bring in five to seven million dollars a year from your dispensary and revenue. That's five to seven hundred grand if you're efficient, you know? That's pretty damn good money. If you're efficient. If you're efficient, of course, (laughs) you got to be smart what you do. Exactly. You know, exactly. But I'm just saying there's money to be made. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like if you, I mean, I'm not saying like in New Mexico is a little bit of a different ball game, you know. I mean, we do okay. I mean, if you took a couple of our stores, like yeah, it'd be all right. But as a whole, it's just there's just so much saturation. Like you know, oh, we'll we'll yeah. get to that later. I'm 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 jumping. So we were talking about what got me into that's that's what got me into. I got I got I just saw the running on the wall. Washington State was done. I'm like I can't. Right. I can't grow here anymore. I had to look for other opportunities, you know, and, and my girlfriend at the time, very supportive. She's like, let's fucking do it. So that's what we did. I, I, her and I got, got in our car. We, I called, I start going on Craigslist, looking at properties, you know, for lease in Albuquerque. Yeah. And then I call, you know, I contact the, uh, whoever it is, the landlord property manager say, Hey, okay. For cannabis. That's all I say. Cannabis retail. That's all I say. Simple. One sentence. Okay for cannabis retail? Question mark. Question mark. Yeah. And they'll say yes or no. The one lady said, she said, not here, but we have other properties available. Mm -hmm. I said, send them over to me. And that's what I did. And I have to give a shout out to Peterson Properties in Albuquerque. Like, they believe in the marijuana industry and the leasing to guys like us. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're not their only marijuana company that they lease to, at least to other people. But very right, because a lot of people slam the door in your face. I mean, it's a lot of rejection. I ain't going to lie. You just got to keep hammering. But I got somewhat a little lucky at that point. And then my wife and I, you know, well, girl, for whatever, we got in the car. We drove right down to Albuquerque, you know, and, and looked at it. And I did an analysis what the traffic count is and blah, 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 you know, making sure it was worth, you know, worth it. You know, you don't want to be on a. On a, on a on a road that has only you know five ten thousand cars a day, that's not a lot, right? You know, you want to get over twenty at least, you know. So we got one was jammed, and and the, and the landlord the 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 plaza that we went in, Old Town Shopping Center, that's a f- flagship location in Albuquerque. Um, there was hardly anyone there. Mm-hmm. Um, we moved in, we brought life to that place. The people. It, the, 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 there was no em- there was no empty spot in about six months of us opening because nice. we brought people into our dispensary. Right, they, right. I mean, we slowed down a little bit because there was more saturation. But back in June 2022, like the summer of 2022, mm-hmm. like it was hot. You know, actually, the whole year was you know from June to, uh, to January of the following year, it was hot. I mean, real hot. I, we haven't seen sales at that location like yet. Right. Hit that right. yet. Mm-hmm. It's close, but you know, you got another store down there and then you got another store opening down there, you know, but luckily, Oh shit. I'm, I'm jumping ahead again. <laughs> it's okay. I got the building. Yeah. I apologize. I got the building. We, I secured the, I secured the building. Mm-hmm. I, I did my research buffer zones and make sure no one blah 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 so sorry so building number one is in albuquerque yes and that's a via craigslist i got that off craigslist okay perfect oh <laughs> and, and, and actually the first building in washington well no washington state i got from a broker i was okay. at least his building but but I, I didn't mention this but the first building i got in washington actually they put a motorium on that mm. area the, the zoning did, so I kind of got pushed out of there. But luckily, the landlord was a broker, or is a broker because he's still around. 
and right. he he hooked me up with the the place I got in Washington State. So, right. you know that I got lucky on that. But yeah, Craigslist isn't that crazy? <laughs> it works. It works. But before we get into that, I've realized that after all of these interviews, dispensary owners need a safe space where they can ask the questions that Google doesn't have the answers for. So what I've done is I've created the world's first dispensary owners mastermind group, where it's an environment of like-minded individuals who can help make each other's lives easier and also make more money in the process. So if that's something that you're interested in, please check out the links in the description below. Now on to the rest of the show. So so what would you say are your your, your biggest challenges in running a dispensary? I've done both things in the marijuana. Like I've done processing and I've done retail. Mm -hmm. it, dispensary by far is the most stressful thing I've ever done. Why? Even with their why? Yeah. Because you got everything coming at you. Like, for example, um, just trouble. You got you got to watch pilferage, right? People stealing. You know, we had issues with that. We had we had to get we hired a security company to help, you know, with stuff. And then they turned out to be garbage. We had to open up and hire our own. We had to set a separate entity for a security company, a separate entity for ATM company. Wow. Like everything is just separate. It's just it, it's a lot more paperwork. Let's just put it mm -hmm. that way. And then, for example, I'll give you a quick story. Um, with that security company that said it was garbage. They had an employee, um, and he decided to sue his employer, which was okay. the guy doing so, sure. and sue my company because he said he got assaulted. Whatever this guy is 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 local, right? Just crazy. So he's trying to serve me and my wife. At now, another thing I got to tell you: when you put your register agent address, do not mm -hmm. make it your house. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's another tidbit. I shouldn't have done that. That's a that's a rookie mistake. Right. I fixed that. But the guy wanted to serve us, and he saw that our address under my wife's name is the registered agent. Mm. So this this guy's coming around, and and this guy's insane, dude. He opened carries. He's just. It was bad news. It it it, it and and then Albuquerque cops didn't want to help. They were on the side of them. He assaulted my neighbor next door, you know, just trying to get in our building. And the it just after that happened, I broke my lease. I just paid the penalty and we moved to a nicer, I'm, I'm a fucking nicer neighborhood. Right, right. And I should have, I'm a downtown type of guy. I love the city. I mean, I went to college in New York City. Like, I, I like it. But, but when you got mm -hmm. a family and you got a bunch of lunatics on the street, you got to think a little differently. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we got a house out of the riffraff. Dog has a yard now, you know? So nice. it worked out. But, I mean, it's just lawyers. Just mm. uh, We spend probably about 30 grand a month on lawyers. And it's not because we're getting sued. It's yeah. because, like, here in Jersey, I have, a, I have a lawyer for land use that's doing hearings for the CRDA and and the city council, I mean, it's just, it, it never ends. And why, and thank goodness New Mexico was easy to do. Like, uh, well, I could tell another story too, but it's, it's a little complicated. But when, and, and after you get your license approved from the state, you have to register with um, the city of Albuquerque. Right. So if you don't, if you don't, um, if you don't have if, – if someone gets him before you – because they put a six 600-feet bu buffer zone mm -hmm, between mm -hmm. ma marijuana dispensaries. Mm -hmm. You can't be within 600 feet of each other. So the dude over at the, the next plaza beat us to it. Okay. So we, we had to do that rule. But the zoning – the zoning council, right, the city council is like three, four months behind. So that means okay. we have we have to wait another three, four. Sure. So you know what I did? I applied for a micro business license because there's no buffer zone for micro business. Okay. I played the game until he called up with me. Yeah. You know, but the CCD said, "Hey, man, you can't be doing this." But like, you gotta. Mm. So I changed the ball over to retail. You know, the proper. But 
I played right. the system, man, because yeah. And, well, you and, did what and, needed to ahead. get done. You you did what yeah. needed to get done. And 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 the crazy part is, it took them longer for them. It took them like six months to open up, mm-hmm. and they didn't even like get it done. Yeah, it's just crazy. But I mean, now we're being the hell out of them in sales, so it, it's all good. Nice, nice. Yeah. So a, a lot of the things are not necessarily the day to day stuff that traditional business owners might have, like you know. Uh, marketing and all those things. But for you, you're finding it a lot with the regulation and compliance and the taxation and all of those things that come with being a cannabis business. Well, marketing, yeah, we have a big market. We spend over 500 grand a year in marketing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a, what of my plan of attacks was, it, it, it blew my mind, Brandon, it blew my mind. One thing in the marijuana industry, when you have a retail store, you always get all the billboards you can around you. Mm-hmm. Always. As fast as you can. Right. Because right. that's that's ad space. And right. I know the regulations vary between state to state. Like here in Jersey, you can't have billboards. New Mexico, you can with limitations, right? Everything has limitations. But I, you know what I started doing? Around when we opened up in June and August, I got about four or five billboards around my competitors. Okay. Right. So I started pu- putting up our, our four for 20 specials and that drew a lot of business. You know, good Google Maps presentation too, and all that. Of course. Um, I'll give a shout to to Max Uhouse from Dope SEO. He's the one that helped us with that Google Maps and and got that shit started for us, you know, proper. Um, but the billboards, yeah, I want the plan of attack. Like, I, I and I'm sitting scratching my head. Why don't you guys have billboards? Right. Like, right. why? Like, at least one or two around your store, because guys like me, I'm going to come around and say, hey, don't go to this store. Go to my store. Mm-hmm. you know <laughs> and then you know from a dispensary running standpoint let's say operationally what would you say are the keys to running a, a successful dispensary make sure you have employees that show up on time mm-hmm. you know um, how do you go about doing that me well i just well, write people up when they <laughs> I, i'll be straight up i haven't managed that store probably what is now probably since uh I don't know, six, six, seven months ago, I was in, you know, running something, if that, a year maybe, right. you know, I've been, I, but, but we built, we have great district managers now that mm. we built and okay. I trained, you know, I trained, uh, trained Daniel personally and, and he's excellent. James comes from Washington state as a previous dispensary manager. So we brought him in. Right. Um, Eric, Eric was, was a dispensary owner in, in Washington state and manager. We brought him in. So we hired outside experts to, to help us, you know, do that. So I don't have to be there doing that. You know right. what I'm saying? So I could come grow the company, which, you know what I mean? And, and then my partners are doing the day to day operations. Um, you know, I, and we're on Slack. You're familiar with Slack, right? Oh yeah, of course. Of course. So, Slack is great. <laughs> so our, you know, we have a Slack at score 420 and that shit's always blowing up with some, I mean, there's 20 different channels. It's insane. Yeah. You know, it's just, there's a lot going on. Like we're building two, we're building out two dispensaries right now. One in Las Cruces, one in Sutherland Park, you know, while maintaining our other six locations, you know, and trans logistics, getting inventory to one store to another, you know, right. You know, buy material because we are, I mean, we're not vertical, but we are a manufacturer and a dispensary. So we process a lot of material. So you know, we go out doing that. There's, there's just, a, there's a lot of attributes, but I mean, minus the, minus the manufacturing end. I mean, you know, it's just like anything else, like at a restaurant, right? The, the vendor comes in, Cisco comes in with his 20 cases of mayo or whatever he gets, you got to sit there and count it in, right? Mm-hmm. They just like intake, like in a marijuana, you got to count each individual package, make sure the lot number's right, right? The dates are right. Everything, the QA is there. You know what I mean? All that type of stuff. That's part of running a dispensary because I've seen, you know, we made mistakes as as manufacturers, you know, in Washington State. I had to fly out to Uncle Ike's to add a number to a to a lot number, one number, and wow. it, and it, and it was, and it was, uh, believe it or not, that you're gonna it, it was forty thousand joints. <laughs> you're working at a scale that I don't think a lot of people are are able to say that they're working at. 
Well, at that point, yeah, I was I was insane. I was selling a lot of joints because a lot of the big stores, right. they wanted that lost. I'm not lost leader, but you know, hey, two, come, come get a two dollar joint and then buy something else. They you know wanted what something. I mean? They wanted something to be able to get people through the door. And, and you know, between you and me, those guys were making money. They were making three times markup almost, like yeah. they should have been. Like every damn product they sell, you know, they just. I mean, you have to sell a lot of them to make a lot of money, you know. But yeah. But yeah, they they love that. They love bringing that in because it, that's the way to bring customers in. For sure. On the marketing side, so um, is there anything else you would add to your pillars of marketing aside from good SEO and billboards? And Weed Maps, we're on Weed Maps. Weed Maps. Premium. Well, I mean, the ordering you should do on your own. Find a good, you know, e-commerce guy to do that. Sure. You know, you know, don't rely on you know Weed Map orders. But other than that, the other side of We Maps, you know, getting your name out there because everybody knows the damn name. It's We Maps or Leafly, right? Right. And Leafly isn't big in New Mexico. It's not, you know what I'm saying? Right, so, right, right, right. And I noticed on the back end, uh, We Maps is a little bit easier to use than Leafly. You know, putting out promos or specials or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. But We Maps is great, man. They, you know, they're. I mean, I mean, they're always trying to upsell shit, but we're on the top tier, like trying to get the best we could get, you know what right. I mean? So right. it works out that for everybody, sense. but I'll tell you what, without weed maps, when we started, I mean, it would, it would took a longer to get noticed. Sure. And sure. the billboards too, obviously. All right. 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 Now, uh, where do you see the future of the cannabis industry heading? Depends what you're talking about. Any way that, you know, affects you the most. It affects me or just, okay, well. You personally, you personally. So okay, me personally. let's say when I, when, when I typically ask this question, a lot of people refer to, you know, uh, you know, the, the scheduling of cannabis or sometimes they just talk about what's going to happen once, uh, you know, uh, it, it is truly a free market. And then you have the Amazons of the world being able to deliver, you know, whatever product it is to people's door, right? Some people are hypothesizing that that is never going to happen. Some people think it will. Some people still think it's going to be on a state by state basis. What are your thoughts? You got to live day to day. Like, All right. and I'm not worried about Amazon, you All know, right. I mean, we tried delivery ourselves for mm-hmm. a little bit and, okay. and it wasn't like, it wasn't that great. I mean, it, at the end of the day, it wasn't that great. And, mm-hmm. Plus, the delivery guy was selling his own product. Like, it just, <laughs> yeah, I know. Sure. <laughs> Insane, right? <laughs> but, I mean, at the end of the day, people want to come in. They want to see They want to see the bud. You right. know, they want to see his manicured to their specification. You, you know how it is. Mm-hmm. You know, there were, like, one thing I will say about delivery, there were certain customers that were regulars. And if we pushed it harder, you know... It could have got bigger, but how big is it going to get to make it worth it? You can have delivery drives with special insurances because you're transporting cannabis. It just goes into a whole lot of bullshit that at the end of the day, is it worth it? I mean, I I mean, I don't think so because the customers are going to come in and they're going to look. And those customers that don't do the delivery, they they still come in. Mm -hmm, They're not mm -hmm. mad. You know what I mean? They're like, hey, you tried it. You know, the 10 regulars who did it. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So uh, we also have a little segment uh, on our show where, where um, I ask the uh, each of our guests um, what question do they have for the next guest that we have on the show. Um, and I have the question from the previous guest. So um, the question from the previous owner, he asked, um, what's the number one uh, biggest draw for customers to come to your dispensary? Um, is it location? Is it because you have a parking lot? Is it because of your venue? Is it because you have a boutique craft cannabis um, and you, they have the finest products in the store? Uh, what typically would you say is the number one draw for people to come into your store? It's all about pricing and value. Hmm. If you go into our store, you know, especially our, our flagship store, it's not very fancy. The walls hmm. are white. You know, we're not there for the ambiance. You know how you go sure. into some stores. They make it look so nice and this and that. and A lot of those Vegas stores. Yeah, Vegas stores. <laughs> are, you know, it's just, yeah, the, the, you know, people think, oh, people want to come to a high-end boutique and have high-end service. Mm-hmm. And they're going to pay the high-end price. Newsflash. People like that only buy one-eighth every two weeks. 
mm-hmm. you know, at 80, you know, a, a $60 eighth, right? And you don't have a lot of those customers, but the value products and the pricing, you can have good high end products at good prices that will bring more people in, right? That's part of what we do. We have good prices. Mm-hmm. And also, we always, and a lot of stores don't do this. And I, you know, I shouldn't be giving this out, but it's just so obvious. When you, price your your items to your customers you always add taxes included Mm. you always add taxes included customers we believe it or not customers sub customers came over to us because of that interesting interesting well because you know think about it you go and you buy an eighth or buy something that's a high low you know two hundred dollar ounce whatever and you know people are going in and like hey man i'm expected to pay 200 you know they don't know about that 22% tax yeah, or whatever that, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and then a lot of, after we started doing that and our four for 20, that and that's going to segue back to the other question, the other question. This is what I'm concerned about. And it's just a fact of life. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we lucky we, we grabbed the niche because we saw a lot of pre-rolls. Right. We're probably, we're the number, I, I can say this with confidence. Our stores is the number one, Free roll seller in New Mexico, mm-hmm. hands down. You know what I'm saying? But what's going on after I did that four for 20, about six to nine months after I started doing that special, because what happens is I've talked to, I've heard through the grapevine through other salesmen who works with, you know, other people, you know, in the industry, like other, you know, business owners, processors and, and dispensaries. And they talk with them on, you know, and one of the things they said about me, they said, I don't know how in the fuck he makes money selling at the prices he sells them at. Mm-hmm. Right. But there's a way you could do it. You know what I'm saying? So, and then the people start come and they figure it out how they could do it. And then they do five for 20. Mm. You know what I mean? You know, and this and that. So you got to stay one step ahead. So what we do is um, when you come in our store, you know how you buy like a multi-pack of joints. Yep. It's always like one strain, right? Yep. Well, we do mix and match. Uh, like a variety pack. Exactly. Uh, up to 56. Right. You know. And, and and another thing I go back to the sales included in the price is that, yeah, you know, you know what you're paying out the door and medical will be cheaper. I never heard anyone say, you know, they expected to pay this price and it's cheaper. And they say, no, I want to pay the other price. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it kind of, a, you know, it's a nice little surprise for them. And plus the rec is like 70% of our customer clientele. So you got to really, you know, make them, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying give them more love. We give our medical patients a lot of love too, with, you know, a thousand milligrams. I sell, we try to sell nothing less than a thousand milligrams. Right. Per package for medical, yeah. like, yeah. you know, you know, 50 milligram gummy, 20 of them, you know, 15, 20 bucks out the, out the door. You know what I mean? 20 bucks out. No, 25. I'm sorry. Thousands, 25 and the 500 is 15. We do have some 500. But what I'm saying is it's, it's always good. You, you got to you got to placate to the rec guys, the rec customers, because they're your bread and butter. Yeah. You got to make what the price taxes included. They know what they're paying and they're happy. Mm-hmm. No surprises, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. and. And people are, you know, people are, you know you know, taking, taking our lead in that, which is great. Other dispensaries, but they're using it against us too. Cause they're taking what we're doing. They're trying to one up us, you know, we're opening, we're in the process of buying some other locations in Albuquerque. Um, but one of my concerns was, is that the one store is like surrounded by five other dispensaries within a mile. Right. Mm. When we, when we start opening shop, they're going to come for our heads, meaning they're going to do specials. So they're going to try to keep their customers at their store, not at our store. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, I, you know, New Mexico is very saturated, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So that's, that's what I could say about my, what's going on for me and like what I see forecasting and about the scheduling. I don't know. It's, it's been, it's been like a, a carrot in front of a donkey these past 10 years. They keep teasing us. Oh, we're going to make, we're going to make yeah. it legal. We're going to make it federally legal. They, I just read on marijuana a moment uh, that they're, they're, Oh, the DEA, they're going to, they're going to reschedule it this week. It's coming. It's coming. It's every, you know, it's just frustrating. It's like, do it or don't. Yeah. You know, just it's just us. buying votes, bro. Like stop yeah. it. 
Just do yeah. it. You'll win. Exactly. If you if you make marijuana federally legal, what who who whatever political power or power is in power, the parties in power, excuse me, mm-hmm. would win that election if they legalized yeah. weed. Mm-hmm. Straight mm-hmm. up. Republican or Democrat. Right. 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 They just keep they just keep holding us back. And I don't you know, I don't know it's because of the two eighty E, they want more taxes out of us. You know, I don't know what the MO is. Like mm-hmm. I just don't understand. It's just we're to the point now, you know, the over there's at least what seventy five percent of the, the states have some form type of right medical marijuana or rec program, right? Maybe it's a little less than I, I don't know, but I know it's more than half, right? You know? I it's don't know. about that. It's about that. It's about yeah. that. It's about right there. I mean, it, I think it, when it really come, boils down to it, like, like at the end of the day, like m- money does talk, you know, and <laughs> I think the whatever powers that may be when it comes to this regulation and stuff like that, they just want to make sure that whatever happens that they get, you know, their, their piece of the, the coin too, um, which can, you know, kind of hold things up. Because I mean, if they just did everything already, like then the money would be flowing. Then you can kind of figure I mean, out how that works. I guess after. you talk about the pharmaceuticals, right? Like I, I, that too. That too. I mean, I don't even. I don't know why they'd be upset because I mean, people need other shit than THC. THC doesn't cure everything. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you need to tax it like alcohol and just get the money, and then just tax, you know regulate like alcohol. That's what yeah. it is. It's a yeah. record. You know, it's just it's like drinking a beer. You know, mm-hmm. people thought thirty years ago. You know, you put whiskey on your kids, you know, baby's gum was a good idea. Now we know that's a horrible idea. Yeah, me too. But I, you know what I'm saying? Like people, views have changed on stuff, you know? Like yes, How 100%. could have we done that? We're so barbaric, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, Things change. Things change I don't, and yeah. stuff. I get you. <laughs> All um, right. So to piggyback on the previous question about the question with the dispensary owner, what question do you have for uh, the next guest that I interview? How many hours you work a day? All right. That's a good one. Ooh, that's a nice one. I like that. How many hours do you work a day? It depends. I do. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not in the stores. When I had to like fire crews and build crews up, I was sure. in there 12 to 15 hours a day. I could I do imagine. Yeah. A- open to close until I found people I could trust. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now, I mean, I'm not sitting there eight hours a day doing this shit, but. <laughs> right. You know, it's just, it's the, you know, I, today, I mean, I've been working a little bit, a couple hours, but I'm not putting, you know, it's not 40 hours a week. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. um, if I had to, I will, but I will, I'll say this when, when we open up this store and new, you know, I have to open up also processing here, you know, of all this shit. So I'm going to have, I'll, I'll be putting my time in again. Trust me. Like right. when we open these stores up, I will be having a couple of people come out and help me from New Mexico, you know, but it's, I still got to be there. You know, right. I can't. All right. Makes sense. So, <laughs> so what's next in store for you? Um, aside, you know, obviously you have the opening and stuff like that, but you know, what, uh, you know, what is score 420 going to look like in the next couple of months slash couple of years? I'm anticipating by end of like around fall, New Jersey will be operational and hopefully Massachusetts should be by the time frame. Right. Um, that was crazy. I got lucky. Um, they had a, and this is organic. I didn't have to buy a license out or anything like this. You know, Massachusetts, you know, it's pretty, the municipality is pretty, you know, tight. You, there's very few cities will allow new dispensaries to come in unless you buy someone out. Right. But we got lucky. Someone forfeited a uh, license in this city. I'm not going to say which one. Because <laughs> the application is not 100% complete yet. So I don't want right. to jump in on my game. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trust me, like, it's crazy, man. You got to watch out for some people. Like, there is, like, I've been screwed over a couple times by, you know, transactions. Got yeah. weed, bought weed with mold on it. I didn't know it until he gave it to me. Shit, and and in Washington State, you you know, most, you know, probably all of them, you don't have to give your money back, no refunds. Really, interesting. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I, no, there's no refunds. Yeah. So whatever, I I just took it, I baked it, I baked it, I made it into the hash. I washed, I baked, I baked the flour real good to kill everything, right? Yeah. And then I just uh, processed it into hash. Excuse me, and sold it as CBD hash and mm. like THC. 
and it sold out. It was only like 50 grams. It wasn't like insane. But yeah. but back then, it was a lot of money, man, because I was... Whew. Yeah, you got to do what you can <laughs> to make it work, right? Bro, you don't even understand, man. Like, I was sweating some of those. I had a friend, my friend Mark, loaned me money. There's like 800 bucks just to pay yeah. for some material, you know, just to, you know, to sell. And, I, you know, I told him, I said, I wrote him a check back because he was he's from Pennsylvania. So he came out to Washington to visit me. I wrote him a check. I said, listen, by the time you land on this plane, you'll be able to cash this check. And I fucking did it. Nice. I sold that. I turned it over and I sold it. It was just shattered. I just packaged shattered, like whatever, yeah. you yeah. know, but made it work. But my buddy helped me out. If he wouldn't have, like, I would have been. Right. Right. Just right. over, just bro, just over like seven, eight hundred bucks. It's just, it, it, it's saying how broke at some point you can be. I, <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine the stories uh, that you must have because I, I know we barely scratched the surface. So this is definitely something that we'll have to run him back again. But as for now, um, where where should people find you if they want to get in touch? Um, they could go to our website, uh, score420.store. And also my email is matt, M-A-T-T, at score420.io. I mean, there's nothing really else I want to plug. I mean, we're in Albuquerque. We got – fine, I'll do a – you ever watch the Jeffersons back in the day? George, <laughs> get the dry cleaners. He always say seven, seven locations, one near you. Right, so it's right. kind of like that shit, like, you yes. know, eight locations, one near you. So, you know, locations in Farmington, Albuquerque, um, Alamogordo, uh, Lo- damn, Los Cruces, Pops. Southern Park is going to be opening soon. Where's the other one? Oh, man, I'm, I should be ashamed of myself. Oh, Pops, Pops no? and Pops. Clovis. There yes. we go. There you go. <laughs> Pops is doing real well. That th- Those Texans, they love the weed, man. Yeah. They love well, it. Well, they, they can't get it locally, so they have to go somewhere. But Matt, you strike me as, you know, as somebody that embodies the I, I will make it work mantra. Um, it sounds like you went through a, a lot of things and just being able to make it work is a skill that I don't think a lot of people have. Um, and is it, is, is it a skill? I think absolutely. I think it's closer to a gritty, uh, to a hustle, to a grind. Where you know if the thing needs to get done, you will get it done, right? right. Um, well, you got to do what you got to do. I've seen people, you know, producers or whoever, you know, other companies spend millions of dollars and lose their shirts. And right. then, and, and, and another thing, I'll just say real quick: you got to scale up. You can't mm-hmm. scale down. Okay. You scale down, you're done. You got to scale up. Like mm-hmm. meaning, like someone going to get a thirty thousand you know, square foot, and then. For two, you go back to them two years, they got fucking half of it not even working yet. Yeah. They're just wasted money and energy. It's just, and you got to know your boundaries. Like, I don't know how to grow. I'm never going to be a producer. I'm never going to run a, a, a farm like mm. that, a, you know, cannabis, growing cannabis. I just can't do it on a, on a mass scale to be profitable. I mean, if I did it on my own for a while, you know, get, get experience in that's different, but I don't have that, you know? Right. I have expertise in operations and processes and look at things, you know, when I got in the marijuana industry, like I've always been a user, right? Like I love pot, but I didn't really understand like dabs until I went to Washington state, like dabs. And, um, man, I fell in love with those, the, the clear. Oh, that shit was real good. The old school clear, the medical days, those guys were really good, really good. I don't know what happened when they went wrecked, but when they were mad, they were really good. Um, and that shit put put me on another level. But like bubble hash and pressed hash, you mm-hmm. know, I learned all that stuff and learned how to do it and how to plan, you know. Then I learned about pre-rolls and how they're easy to, you know, to do, you know. So a lot of farmers or producers, they don't like making pre-rolls. It's, they have a real hard time doing it. Or they get these outrageous six-figure machines, cost machines, you know, that a couple employees could do in a day easily. And, you know. You don't have to worry about clean, you know, you know, cleaning the machine all the time, sticking up, and I mean, you know, and you get people jobs, you help the economy. That's another end of it too, you know. Right. That's why marijuana is very labor intensive. You need a person, you know, to do each tray of, you know, pre rolls all day to keep up with the demand, or mm-hmm. you know, trimming flour, you know, filling carts, you know, packaging, whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> 
a lot, lot into a, it. A lot of different things. But yes, um, the embodiment of doing what is required um, is, is, is sitting in front of me right now. So again, you know, thank you for taking the time out of your day for, for chatting with me and for hopping on the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Um, that's it for us today. Um, just wanted to say thank you for all who's listening. I'm your host, Brandon Kwan. And until next time, do, 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 I will see you later. <laughs> thank you, Brandon. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. My name is Brandon Kwan, and I'm the founder of Cannabud Marketing, the number one marketing agency of choice for dispensaries, both in the United States and in Canada. If you ever want to get in touch with me about any marketing strategies, tips, and tricks, I can definitely help you. Just go visit our website at cannabudmarketing.com. That's C A. N-N-A-B-U-D marketing.com or just check the links in the description below. Until next time, talk to you later. Bye.